Hello. This is Ed Gallo. This is the Fight Sites MMA podcast. I'm joined by Shram Raleidarn and Ben Cohn, special guest here. Um, first of all, gentlemen, how are you doing? I'm fine. Uh, the, the fights aren't making me fine. That's a different conversation. But in a vacuum, I'm okay. It's pretty good for you. It's pretty good. And Ben, yeah, are you still uh, riding the wave of your amateur MMA debut win? No, I started dying it again. No, no. <laughs> I got to lose the 20 pounds I gained and get back. It looks good shape, on you. So it, It's definitely not hurting my grappling. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it's really helping top control. Didn't now we say after this fight butt. that you would put on weight and do 170? Uh, no, I, I want to drop to 55. No, oh. I, the problem is, is I don't have, I don't have a reliable way of lifting weights to actually put on proper size. Mm. And that's kind of the main issue. So mm. I'd rather fight at 55 and be at size parity with the people I'm fighting, even though the last guy fought was fucking enormous. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you're going to avoid that issue at either weight class. I think people are going to be big, so might as well just feel good. But, you know, unless you, yeah. uh, we'll see. We'll see. You do you. I'm not going to, I'm not your mom yet. That That is true. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be my stepdad soon, though. Mm-hmm. You are cooler than my mom. Thank you. That's a, that's a huge honor. Um, it's a big, big, it's a high bar to clear. Anyway, so it's an MMA podcast. But, you know, the thing is that the fights have been subpar all time low in terms of being meaningful in terms of being good to watch and we did do a sorry we did do a commentary for johnny walker versus Thiago santos but uh god intervened and something went wrong with (laughs) our audio and it just it's not it's not you can't listen to it it doesn't line up right i mean you uh, couldn't listen to it to start with either because like then you have to watch the fight yeah if I'm really bored someday, I might like try to figure out how to line it up. But uh, it was entertaining just because we talked about things that weren't the fight basically the whole time. But yeah. And then uh, we took the week off just because there was nothing to talk about. And then, uh, yeah, this card happened and I still feel like there's nothing to talk about. I can't remember a single thing that happened. What was the main event? Uh, Marina Rodriguez versus oh, Mackenzie well, Dern. Okay, that's actually kind of cool. Marina that Rodriguez was actually fine. good. Yeah. That was a good fight. Go um, ahead. And tell I, me about I it. I actually enjoyed that. I watched it, but well, you go ahead. <laughs> so Dern did, did some really cool jujitsu shit, and then I had the audacity to make a Twitter video. Well, to be fair, I was very high. But I I was like, jujitsu works. See? It works. And then the rest of the fight happened. I, I could like, have told you that before the rest yeah, of the fight happened. I felt really bad. I, I regret it. It was, it was the it second was round, right? Yeah, the second round, the Dern second round arguably ten yeah. and then Rodriguez ten her right back. Well, yeah. talk, talk to me. Talk to me about what she did in the second round. What made you excited? Uh, I just really, really, her pressure, her ability to um, shut down any opportunities for for Marina to really get any space to scramble. Um, and any time there was space created, she was just able to just completely shut her down. Um, I, her ground and pound was surprisingly brutal. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just didn't matter because she didn't have a reliable way of getting it there. And the, the, yeah. the whole time I was watching the fight, like in the beginning, I'm like, Dern has no clue how to pressure, which is a problem because she wants to close the distance and get the takedown. And her method was to blitz behind punches, but she also had no reliable way of really threatening with those punches. Once no Marina confidence got her to like eat a counter and keep going. She backed off a lot. Which is surprising because she has taken big shots before mm-hmm. without really much issue. Well, maybe that's so why. I don't know what she was so scared of. She did get maybe backed off by Hibas out. countering her a bunch, though. Hibas gets harder than Marina in a single shot counters, I would say. Maybe, but... More Rodriguez athletic, has like. really heavy hands. Like, yeah. I, I, the Hibas, right, that she, you know, Florida a couple times and yeah, you know, just with women's true, MMA, true, true. especially 115. Have you seen people getting dropped clean uh with single shots? Like you know they hit so hard because just on it's, it's, it doesn't happen. It's yeah. Just on Drage, really. I mean uh, even on Drage, like it's on Drage, but it's also now yeah. it's it's Rodriguez and um uh I think Amanda Lemos is is the mm. new one. Uh she knocked yeah, out she floored um, somebody uh the scarfold woman uh, uh Montserrat Canejo oh, yeah Go Montserrat Dines. Canejo why do I yeah, know that uh, yeah that was like a really fast knockout just one yeah. puncher so um they, thank they god exist. 
thank <laughs> God she knocked her out because I couldn't deal with another one of uh I couldn't deal. With, I couldn't deal yeah, with no, that was those. that was bad. That that's a fight style that shouldn't work at all. Um, but yeah, no, you know, I, I agree that Mackenzie Duran like didn't have any sort of clue how to uh, enforce her game. But she also, you know, her her best takedowns are upper body. I think she went like double under hip toss. Uh, to take mm-hmm. not even to take um Rodriguez she down at first. She rolled through it, but then she pulled guard and transitioned super fast. And her transitions, uh, she's her instincts on that are crazy. Um, I mean, I'm sure she's it's amazing. drilled into memory, but yeah, she transitioned so quickly. Um, so it makes you wonder why she didn't pull guard at all because she swept her almost immediately um, in round two when she was on on her back. You know, yeah, but it's I mean, also it kind of an issue with clinch entries and like in general, Rodriguez is a pretty solid clincher. Uh, there's a lot of like little frames and knees and mm-hmm. stuff that could have put her off. And you know, she was put on the back foot pretty consistently after a point. Yeah. She yeah, can't Dern's shoot. game is so disconnected. She it can't doesn't shoot. really work. Yeah, so she she's got Ronda Rousey syndrome. She can't kick mm. and she can't shoot. And that that'll that'll ruin I your hate. game for sure. You need I, to be able I to do hate. those things. Dude, At least one I hate of them. her stance so much. Oh, yeah. The way she like leans over her right hip and has that like it's so weird and awful well you know i've had much worse reasons to hate fighters i was just talking on twitter <laughs> today and uh kyler phillips i hate him purely because his name is kyler so but there, there you go a, he's a at like a ton of fun he's, he's like good. the fighter you should enjoy he's fine he's fine i, like I don't him. No, I, don't. I don't like him. I'm never going to root for him, but I do like him. It's, I don't it's like weird. Him. It's weird. <laughs> like, even if his name wasn't Kyler, I feel like I wouldn't like him. But because his name is Kyler, I kind of have to say That's that. That's not his fault. He can change his name. It's legal. He, psh, man, it's a lot of work. <laughs> He's like a less that. skilled but more psychotic Anthony, uh, not Anthony, uh, Charles yeah. Jordan. Yes, he's just like Anthony. That's Smith, how I would I describe agree. I don't, I'm not sure I don't see that. that, but I do like that he I can said, wrestle. He's a less he's very, skilled, he's very more insane. He's he can very wrestle. Well-rounded I just, and I just kind of hate his striking. His striking, honestly. yeah, it's his striking style. <laughs> I don't really like, but he is pretty good at it. But he should have killed Paiva. Um, although he he did kill Paiva he tried a bunch his of times. Best. <laughs> yes, in a sense, the Paiva Phillips decision was awful, but in another sense, the right sense, it was the best decision in MMA history. Yeah. <laughs> I support robberies when they're in favor of fighters. I like. Absolutely. That's completely unironic. Um, but yeah, the, the Rodriguez Dern fight was annoying, but Rodriguez did a good job. Um, to, she was, she was, she played it pretty safe, but I think that's, that's what you do in a main event situation against a, a mm-hmm. fellow top five ish person. And, um, yeah, now she's trying to fight you wanna, uh, your J chick, that which, sounds um, like tons of fun. Yeah. Yeah. That does sound great. And everyone's like, oh, yo, you wanna will stomp her, but like, maybe not. Um, she can't wear shots nearly as well as she used to, which wasn't that good in the first place. And I think people right. might be underestimating how much Rodriguez can bother her. Also, they're underestimating Joanna fighting people that can punch. Um, it hasn't happened a lot. And when it has happened, it's bothered her. So I'm in. I'm in for it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, even despite like the it. grappling of Rose, I think Marina might be a pretty tricky matchup for her. Yeah. Like, I don't, I've don't. i never really rated Rose as much of a takedown artist. She had, like, those couple ugly ones on Joanna. Where, she, like, did she, the, kinda, she did the Dillashaw. Yeah, she, like, <laughs> sagged on her leg and just, like, kind of sat on her. But other than that, I've never really rated her as much of a takedown artist. And honestly, I feel like someone who's going to consistently put combos together and pressure her back, that's pretty bad news for her. So, I mean, and can provably go five rounds where Rose has had some trouble in those situations mm-hmm. before. I'm, I'm interested. I'm definitely interested. The range will also be interesting. Mm-hmm. The, she's going to have... A, Rose won't have that, uh, that size disparity to work with when she had the fight with Joanna. And Andrage. like you said, like Marina can hit pretty hard. Oh God, Andrage. Andrage in a five rounder beats Rose. I'm standing oh, by that. Easily. Easily. Every, every time. I mean, yeah. arguably she didn't even lose a three rounder. The third rounder could have been a 10 True. eight. Yeah. So like, I, I'm not sold on Rose as some sort of dominant champion. I think that there are bad matchups for her also. Marina is definitely a bad one if she can keep Rose off her on the ground. Cause Rose mm-hmm. is a pretty solid grappler. Yeah. Yeah, There's no sure. question about that. She's a really solid grappler. She's a very dangerous sub hunter. You so, say that, I'd love but to when see Carla Esparza that. top games her again, you're going to change your tune. <laughs> I I would actually unironically be the happiest person on the planet. Okay, that's Carla sad. I don't, that. I don't support that. You're a strange man. Mm-hmm. You're, yeah, that's gross. I'm sorry. You're it would, diseased. It would, you it should would be. shatter. It would shatter those those weird, creepy fan on Twitter's like obsession with Rose. Okay, but you uh, can I, have I, a better fighter beater for that. She got it, dumped it, it on will. her head, and that didn't end. You know, it's 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 never ended. Yeah, because that. 
but did you not see the creepy, weird, like, we have to protect Rose by banning slams like protect that? Protect her from Pat Barry if you're going to protect oh, her. That's yeah. good point. Your priorities are no, way out of No, they're just whack. a loving couple from when she was 14 and he was in his 20s. What do you mean? He doesn't even hide it. And it, he you doesn't. Ever read the interview where he's like, it was love at first mm-hmm. sight. We met when she was and 14. And Rose is like, God. it was 18. I was 18 when we started dating. Oh, like, no. She's like trying to correct him. Yeah, you yeah. can yeah. tell. Like, like, even if she stories. was 18, he was waiting for it. Um, is yep. bad is, is it's bad yep. but moving on to a more fun topic randy brown's weird toe thing i okay, it's a little I'm embarrassing honest, uh, yeah. on, whenever i see a fighter get injured in a fight where it's like this should be a very you shouldn't be able to win the fight with this injury and then the other person doesn't win I'm just like, stomp on the toes you, over and over you, you fumbled the bag a little bit uh, <laughs> i love that fight i unironically love that fight mm-hmm. i really did because randy brown is fun as hell offensively and a, just a defensive void yeah i've never really I, I rated Randy brown but yeah. he knew the range pretty well though uh in terms yeah. of just the boxing uh against gooden uh mm-hmm. so he basically didn't take any clean shots to the head from what i saw which it, it was like he he was you know he, he wasn't shoulder rolling but he was doing something <laughs> uh and he was trying I, it kind of seemed like he didn't need to do that and that gooden was already out of range trying to hit him but uh yeah, he didn't he didn't take any clean shots which is like annoying because gooden should have gone to the body in that case if someone's leaning back um but he did boot his legs a bunch of times but that um that damage started to seem like it was getting to the point where it was adding up and you could have started to drop him more because he was dropping him onto his butt um then he just kind of uh stopped doing know. it he stopped naturally. doing it and i get it it's it's hard it's a uh, it's a lot of energy to to go full steam uh low kicking uh more taxing than people think if they haven't done it but mm-hmm. on the other hand that's the win is there it's there. This is not a one-to-one comparison, but this annoyed me uh, with Izzy and Vittori, where it built up really quick um, with the, the leg damage, and then he just kind of got away from it and started to try to focus Spam on other things. Lead like, take, take it, take it. It's there. Um, so that stuff bothers me, but it's not like it. Uh, it was all just like good and not doing a good job. Like to, in spite of the injury, I think Brown mm-hmm. held up ridiculously well, and he's. Super tough. Oh my god. Yeah. Like how, how do you do that? Um, it looked really like at one point he that. like was uh putting his foot on his leg and he might have set his toe and fixed it and then was okay after that. That's crazy. He was constantly doing it, and then mm-hmm. one time he actually did it like he kind of stomped it and it put it back into place and it was good for a little bit, and then it came back out of place because he kicked again. <laughs> and and he just was he, like I saw his reaction, he's like, You gotta be fucking kidding me. But, so what um, was it? He that, kicked he kicked Gooden in the face kick. and broke his toe. Yeah, he, he did like a front kick. He basically drops him with this insane front kick, like my dare I say Anderson Silva esque. Uh, <laughs> the competition seems about the <laughs> same. Dare. So yeah, careful with uh, comparisons, Ben. You got yourself in trouble last time you did this. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that front kick was actually pretty badass, and I, yeah. I actually jumped out of my seat just and screamed oh but and then he broke his toe and couldn't get the finish credit to gooden he toughed that out himself he took a shitload of damage i respect him yeah i mean he did the same him. against joe ben too so yeah Definitely he's, a tough he's guy. gonna be a tough out for a lot of guys just mm-hmm. by cause of that durability and the fact that he is strong he can he can fight okay and pretty much every needs area. to pace himself yeah and he has that so. sort of weird booping power where, like, it doesn't look like he's <laughs> punching super hard. But, like, that last uh, knockout he got over the, the guy, I think he was, like, German or something. It was, yeah. like, <laughs> half a minute I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. That was funny as hell. Yeah, he just, like, he kind of hit him with, like, a throwaway 2-3 three or a 3-2, and it just kind of dropped him and killed him immediately. It was weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I don't really follow these guys that much. I do know that uh, Randy Brown, as you mentioned, the kind of uh, rangy game, he did that well against Brian Barberina as well. Where he was mm-hmm. either all the way in or all the way out. Like he smothered him in the clinch and just kind of long kicked him on the outside. So he's capable of that. I think he's been improving. I just still don't, you know. I, I guess it's welterweight, but a lot of people can. What's that? His only loss in the last five fights is, is uh, Luke. Luke. Like, and he fought solidly in that and fight. Nico knockout did. was more than five fights ago. It was exactly six fights ago. Time is moving too quickly. I don't like this. Yeah. 
I mean, that wasn't the, like. Do you remember the, the the other day they the UFC account was like the Impa Kasanganai, uh, Yoki oh, yeah. Buckley knockout Dude. was one year ago. I'm like, what are you talking Dude. about? One year ago, it was last <laughs> week, and then I looked it up, and it was October 11th, 2020. And like, yeah, that what? was the San Hagen Marias card, right? That felt what? way more recent yep. too. What? And it's like turns out San Hagen's fought like twice since then. Like, what Blew the my fuck? mind. I hate Forget that. the fact that it was six fights ago. It was in 2018. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure like that was the same card that yeah. Chad Mendes won. So. <laughs> really? Oh, that was Boise, no right? Was that the Boise uh, card? Mendes was not on this card. Damn it. Okay. It, was like the, it was the in one? South Carolina. South Carolina. Greenville. It was the more, it fight was nights. it was when Jung it was oh when it was Casey, Moicano okay yeah he murdered wait that was Moicano. 2019 it makes uh, sense that you would repress oh, that memory the for him. <laughs> sorry that was the Barbarina card my bad you're right Jesus uh, okay I'm gonna nope. take a look this is, at the... it was on the Dos Santos Ivanov card yes that is Mendez that is definitely it was Mendez, Mendez jury. versus jury you See, are correct I was right wow. all along fuck you guys wow also Captain I Gano didn't... fought on that card because holy shit Rick Glenn Dennis Bermudez. Sage Northcutt is the Oh, he event. beat fucking Zach Otto on that <laughs> card. That was Otto. terrible. All right. That was wow. the best. Yeah, anyway, that's oh changed God. a lot in three years. Yeah. <laughs> Volkanovsky beat Darren Elkins on the undercard. All right. Well, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, we actually did this <laughs> podcast. Like, we asked a bunch of questions on this, or we asked people for questions on Discord precisely not to talk about this card. And we've already talked about it for about 15 minutes, I'd wager. Yeah, 16, 20. So. Yeah, good job, everyone. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, so I asked on Discord to our patrons, and if you want the opportunity to ask questions, as always, just uh, you know, subscribe to the Patreon. I believe it's five dollars to get into the Discord. Five dollars mm-hmm. to ask us questions and talk to us and be part of a beautiful community with lots of different discussion channels. And if you're paying that five dollars, you're also covering your three dollars for all of our exclusive content on Patreon, which, which is, is just an insane amount of stuff. A lot. I worked my ass off putting a lot of stuff on there for you guys over the past couple of years. If you don't subscribe and watch it, I did it for nothing. And uh, I'm going to end my life. You should feel very sad. There you go. If you're going to make me question my entire existence, if you don't subscribe, I'm threatening you. I'm holding myself hostage. Uh, You better subscribe or (laughs) bad things will happen to this guy. A human will, sacrifice will, will be conducted every LGBT week. LGBT guy subscribe. Fox, so says Listen, our favorite if you YouTube guys, <laughs> If you all don't subscribe, I promise to pull guard on you, and we know that I will. if I do that, you will lose a decision. He so, will butterfly sweep you eventually. I will butterfly sweep He'll, you. He'll, He'll get, get it. it. <laughs> I will get it. <laughs> it's a matter of time. <laughs> all right, let's do right. some questions then. So, uh, let's, well, let's run through the easy ones. How do I win the MMA from our favorite... I got this. Pull this guard Karth? and butterfly. Yes. <laughs> Is that Karth? Yeah, that's Karth. All right. Shout out to Karth. Karth um, watched it live. Yeah. Yeah, he drove seventeen hours. Which that's is how Ben wants amazing. to win MMA fights is to pull guard. Um, I would say that's not a consistent way to win MMA fights, but at the amateurs, there are skill disparities, so you can just be way better at grappling than people. Yeah, and pull also guard on Ben. Them. Ben could do it to anybody, but if you're yeah. a normal human being, Ben's got know. that energy. He's, yeah, he's just he sees red, and then he so pulls I don't care about your win conditions. I'm going to pull guard. <laughs> <laughs> on a wrestler who outweighs me <laughs> on a wrestler <laughs> by 20 pounds but seriously the way to win mma fights uh i would definitely reference danny martin's mma metagame series which is basically about that is how do how do people tend to win mma fights and the first word that we have to say is initiative um you have to know what you're going to do and you got to start doing it pretty much right away and it doesn't mean you have to lead it doesn't mean you have to pressure but if you're going to be countering, if you're going to be playing outside, you need to establish your threats right away um, and make the fight into the dynamic that you need. And so often we see people either being reactive or purposeless with the way they fight and they leave things so much more up to chance and they, they rely on their, they rely on their skills um, to bail themselves out and they rely on their physicality to bail themselves out. But really what comes down to it, like a game plan is, you know, what are you doing consistently to create the kind of fight that you need? So what's, what, what are some good examples? Um, maybe compare and contrast that you can think of where the fighter has established the initiative or they've established, you know, the patterns they need versus the ones where they don't. Mm, I mean, my mind is always going to go to the fights I like the most. 
Sure. So uh, Rob Font for Scotty Garbrandt is a fun example because like you could see both guys had, I wouldn't say similar skills, but you could see one guy had a real idea of what he was doing and the other guy was just kind of taking it as it came, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. waiting for the other guy to walk into counters and not doing anything. Oh yeah, you get both the other in the same fight there. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like I think it serves as a weirdly good example. Like we were talking about fucking video games earlier and I kept referencing Cuphead, but it worked. So sometimes it works out, but yeah, uh, it was a good example because like, you know, one guy had a really good idea of how to establish the initiative, work with, like establish the range that he needed and build off his threats, where the other guy just kind of needed stuff to break the right way in order for it to work. Uh, so I think that's a decent example from the best fight of the year, just, you know, obviously, easily. Mm-hmm. Just the one that made you happy. Just watch any Alex yeah. fight. Just um, watch any Alex Volkanovsky fight. Yeah, Volkanovsky is very intentional, very active. Um, so that's like one of the easiest examples you can get, um, yeah. in terms of wrestling, this is definitely stuff that I talk about is you need to have a plan for how are you going to take these people down? And it doesn't matter if you want to be someone who's working them on the cage, or if you want to be someone who's hitting reactive shots, you need to set up that dynamic. And it's pretty simple. If you want to take people down in the cage, you need to become a pressure fighter. You need to pressure. You will not get them to the cage. If you don't, the only one who's really getting away with that is Kamar Usman, who has that nice snatch single that he can walk people to the cage with if he gets an open space. Um, also, he can kind of just decide to pressure whenever he wants because he has a huge physicality and power advantage and no one's good on the back foot that he's fighting. Anyway, um, in I terms of example like... that's super random also after this. I got you. Chad Mendes is the mm. best example of setting up reactive shots uh, because he plays so well off the counter and his counter threat is so serious and his threat in the lead is so serious that people do sometimes feel uh, mm, panicked into pursuing him or you know trying to hit him like it's so funny watching his early career because everyone's so freaked out by him being this good wrestler that they come at him right away they come right after him like you stupid mother <laughs> like you <laughs> he just walked forward doing the Forrest Griffin you know alternating straights um hips right there coming into him with momentum you don't get that in a wrestling match you don't get someone throwing their weight forward at you with their hips unprotected. Like that is such an easy takedown. Um, so for a while, that was just what he did. And then later on when he kind of got it with Dwayne Ludwig, he's like, all right, I can set up some pretty, you know, sophisticated striking dynamics with these people where I, I have this good counter game, but I can also uh, mix up my, my shots off the back foot. So if you want to take shots off the back foot, get a good back foot striking game um, and also get good on the lead to encourage people to pressure you. So it's intentional, you know, it's all about having an idea and doing everything in the fight to contribute to that idea. Um, it's not like Brian Ortega. It's really the opposite of Brian Ortega where he's like, he's got some stuff and he's like, eventually this might lead to a situation where I can you know, sprint, um, which is how I think I would describe it. But, you know, that knockdown off the uh, off the caught kick or or off the kick rather from Ortega Volkanovski, that's yeah, it was intentional. Um, he he knew he was hitting it, but did was that a sure thing to set up a grappling situation? Not really. Um, he's just like I'll hurt him eventually. He'll duck duck his head eventually. He'll you know I'll end up in a situation eventually. He's just kind of banking on one one time uh, in five rounds. I can get this done, but. That is the opposite of intention. That is the opposite of taking initiative. It's it's opportunistic. I think that would be the other end of the spectrum. But um, it's there's a reason why it's pretty rare for people to win at championship levels consistently who fight like that. Um, pretty much all of the champions right now are people who enforce something. Um, and it's pretty clear. It's cl- pretty clear what they do. Yeah, um, I mean, I think another... Sorry, well, I think Ben had some. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Mine's a dumb... Mine's a f- Fun, yeah, dumb example, yeah, but yeah. I have thoughts anyway. Go so ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, either way, uh, mm-hmm. mentioning the wrestling dynamic that you need to pressure, I think a good example of someone moving away from that, and we talked about it a bunch of times, is Kevin Lee. Uh, we yeah. saw him uh, earlier in his career against fighters like Edson Barboza and even RDA, the losing performance. They were super strong, right? Because he knew how to set up the shots that he wanted uh, with solid pressure, nothing super great, but he could pressure at long range, jab, kick, and eventually shoot on guys on the fence. And then you saw the issue with his TriStar approach uh, against um, Charles Oliveira, where he just kind of conceded the back foot, didn't really have a way he to turn it. He fought Iaquinto like that, too. Yeah, I mean, he managed to get a couple takedowns against Iaquinto as well, but he it was definitely him. hard to work. just like yeah. being, being strong. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, Iaquinto got way more opportunities than he deserved in that fight as well. So mm-hmm. 
which Same is with the D-Rod uh, fight. He didn't set up those takedowns whatsoever. Yeah, he's strong through them, which is insane in mm-hmm. its own right. Like, if you can do it, like, some of those just, they were freakish. But the Oliveira fight against a really intentional pressure fighter really showed the big drawback in that approach because he was up against the fence. He needed to really work hard to get to Oliveira's hips instead of, like, being able to work through takedowns the way that he wants to and strong through just people's underhooks instead of strong through their entire body. So, yeah, go ahead, Ben. So the funny random example that I love is the Eric Spicely versus Tiago Santos fight. <laughs> That's a good I'm one. I'm not kidding. It's 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 both hysterical because it's this insanely unathletic, like I need this submission or I'm gonna die. And he fought like it. He grabbed a hold of Tiago and did everything in his power to drag him to the mat and submitted him. And that's how every single fighter should fight with the skills that they have. If you're a mm-hmm. grappler and you know you can't out-wrestle this dude, then get your ass to the mat in some fashion that's going to put him in danger so that he doesn't want to be there. Whether that's a leg entanglement or a sacrifice throw into a sweep, an arm drag, something, you know? Um, the other thing I want to mention is that if you look at the champions who never really were able to establish dominant range, uh, reigns, guys like Anthony Pettis, guys like Luke Rockholt, uh, you know, a big part of that is because they were, didn't really have games that were, in for, they were able to enforce, or, or it wasn't intentional. It was, I'm really athletic, I'm really powerful, I'm super fast, I'm dynamic, and I'm able to just create these moments of of chaos where I'm going to win. Uh, guys like Anthony Pettis are a perfect example where they just didn't have the the proper games to enforce what they were really good at because it's just they didn't have to for most of their career. A guy like Anthony Pettis, if he had a cohesive game that was actually able to enforce, he wouldn't have lost to a guy like Clay Guida. And that's a very telling loss. And the fact that it was be able to be recreated on a way worse scale by RDA mm-hmm. and others shows that he never really developed that. Luke Rockhold, same problem. And that's and when your physicality starts to fade, that's when they really run into issues. So there are guys who can last with that game for a really long time, just based on the fact that they're a freak athlete, but it's not reliable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think Rockhold's a funny example because he did have several ranges where it worked, but it was also kind of a, a weird lack of like contingency planning, where if his kicking game didn't work, there would be no way for him to default to the grappling, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, everything's cohesive, but there's no way for him to get from one place to another without his opponent consenting to it. Uh, we've seen that with John Jones as well. Uh, especially now that his uh, wrestling is getting kind of suspect. Um, he could, you know, like, if he couldn't move through the pocket, for instance, uh, he didn't really have a way for people to get wrestled, which is, like, it's a funny way to put it, but that's why a lot of his recent wins have been kind of anemic, for instance. It's like, you can win that way. It's just, it's going to be, A, unimpressive, and B, you're working with low margins in that sense. I mean, Jones isn't because he's just, you know, unkillable, but Luke Rockhold for shows now. the... Yeah. Yeah, until he fights in Ghana. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe in Ghana just like destroys his brain without knocking him out. That's also possible. <laughs> it's Iron head. Let's do another question. Great. So this one's a bit more specific. It's from Rafael Trace Anjos. Um, how to have the most success as a naturally slow, low cardio fighter, but you do have some natural strength and power, examples of good slow fighters, and why is being slow such a bad thing? So I'm going to take this one backwards because it's a lot easier that way, to be quite frank. Uh, Why is being slow such a bad thing? Well, I mean, there are some really good examples of why speed advantage has helped. You can get away with positioning errors. You can get away with worse mechanics. Uh, Michael Johnson is a good example of that, where he's not always the most responsible positional fighter or even the most responsible defensive fighter, but he's so fast of foot and of hand that he can just, you know, kind of angle out and really quickly just kind of knock your block off. Um, And... In general, like a lot of really fast, uh, Giga Chikadze is a fighter who a lot of people have pointed to as being like really fast of hand after his last fight against Edson Barboza. And I would argue that he really needs that because he has like this kind of flappy hand boxing style that like it wouldn't work if he was at speed parity. So being at a speed disadvantage, it means that everything needs to be super tight. Um, it is possible though, and that brings us to our next question examples of good slow fighters. The one I'll always point to here is Pedro Munoz. Uh, and He's not even slow in an objective sense, really. It's just that Bantamweight is filled with like yeah. insanely quick fighters. And Munoz is especially notable because he's faced perhaps the two quickest, right? He's fought John Dodson and he's fought Cody Garbrandt. And he's one and one against them, which is more than a turtle stuck in molasses should be. Aldo's still pretty fast, even at 60% of his max speed. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, that's, that's also true. I mean, I mean, that doesn't really make as good of a point because he did look very slow in that fight. <laughs> but... 
but not because he was slow, but because of several other reasons. Uh, so I'll, I guess I'll plug the article here. Go read that. But yeah, uh, so Pedro Munoz is a good example. And the reason really is that he has a tool set to really mitigate the sort of speed disadvantages. Uh, the two fights against Jimmy Rivera show, A, how a speed advantage can kill him because Rivera in the first fight kind of boxed him up in the pocket, but B, how he can mitigate it with a really solid attritional game, a tight left hook, uh, solid ability to like draw counters. That He did that against uh, Frankie Edgar as well. You just need to be, as I mentioned, you need to be a lot, a lot tighter in every other respect to make up for a speed disadvantage. I think that's the big thing. The one thing that he did mention, though, is low cardio. And if there's That's true. Depth, Munoz is a bad add. example of that. And he's got amazing chin. Yeah. Um, I think a better example, granted you said really good fighter, so I don't know how <laughs> you're going to take this one, but Alexei Olenek. Um, he's a very good example of what was described. So The question like is, nine, does he work? Right, and it works. <laughs> like, There's no question that for the most part it works really well in his division. He's his 956 division. years old. <sighs> He's still able to somehow get some wins. The dude is, the way that you do it is, like you said, you get a good game that doesn't require you to have a speed advantage. Um, and one, being a super heavy top control grappler. That's a good approach. Yeah. Also got kind of clubbing weird power in his hands, despite not being the largest heavyweight, but then getting heavier as his career goes on. like. That helps. So if you're that kind of person where you're slow and you have shit cardio and you should be a grappler, know, be a grappler, <laughs> honestly, like be a heavy ass top control grappler with and you said you have natural power. So use it. Get people to pick their hands up and block your punches. Get the takedown. That's that's probably the best way to go about it. Stylistically, I would say. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, if you have the skill set, especially like really long exchanges or like cage grappling or like top position, they're A, going to save your cardio, and B, make a speed disadvantage a lot less meaningful. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the striking, again, you really just need to be able to dictate the exchanges a bit more than the average fighter, because you can't afford ones that you don't see. Uh, and I mean, it's kind of tough to think of fighters like that, just because a lot of the fighters who I think of as like really, really strong at dictating exchanges, they tend to be not even necessarily all that slow for their division. It's just something that works in theory. And you can see that, like, for Pedro Munoz, for instance, he doesn't really have to worry about that because he is just, he, anything he doesn't see, he just eats anyway. So, like, conceptually, an approach like a Sun Sao would work, but realistically, a Sun Sao is pretty quick. So that's not really the way that it is. I would also say just quickly that um, if you're going to be slower, you're probably going to eat shots. So you're going to need to keep your eyes open, and you're going to need to be aware that you're going to eat shots. So um, having a stupidly good chin won't hurt. <laughs> But um, having a solid base that can like absorb the and disperse the the force of the punches you're going to be taking uh, is going to help. So if you're not going to get used to being hit while also being slow, that's a terrible combo. Like if you're going to have bad reactions to being hit and you're slow, yeah, fighting's not for you. Honestly, it just isn't. Right. Uh, so let's go next question. I mean, there are a lot of joke questions. Wins that made you the happiest. That's a good one. I mean, I already mentioned one of them, but uh, you guys can go ahead. Hmm. I mean, recently, Dustin Poirier knocking out Conor McGregor. I mean, I haven't been happier than that. And I don't know if... Ever, well, it's tough because <clears throat> my my MMA fandom has, has had uh, eras, has changed over time. I think for... For the better, because I understand the sport more and I'm smarter and my takes are more correct. But it was definitely nice in the times where I my it wasn't as complicated and I liked people for different <laughs> reasons. And um, I was a diehard Frankie Edgar fan. Um, and I was oh, a so diehard Frankie Edgar fan. No, <laughs> <laughs> I was a diehard Frankie Edgar fan right before he won the title um, for the first time. So like that whole his his first his not his his only his lightweight title streak um was so dramatic and uh yeah just like when he knocked out Gray Maynard in the third fight like that I was overjoyed um I was really happy about that um so that one made me really happy um I don't know why but I remember like taking a lap because I was so hype 
when Mark Hunt knocked out Stefan Struve. I, don't, <laughs> I didn't cool. even like hate Struve or anything like that. It was just, it was just awesome. I was like, wow. Like, <laughs> I was like, that was sick. Um, I don't know. Just it's different things make me excited. But yeah, um, I, I would say in terms of everything about it, uh, Dustin Poirier knocking out Conor McGregor made me so happy. I mean, you've been on commentary with me enough times that you yeah. can probably remember times that we've been happy uh but it's just i don't know i mostly remember times i was sad <laughs> yeah that is how the sports trended and honestly like my happiest moment was one where i was all by myself which is such a shame but yeah like font garbrandt um, yeah font garbrandt that's your happy easily uh the one that i can remember at least yeah um, i mean probably a cater win but i can't remember any of them where i was like super into cater at the time cater burgos was dope but i also watched that with mm. a bunch of people so it's like oh, tough to be that excited. Stipe versus DC too. That was dope, but also I was disappointed in Stipe for the entire fight. So I guess you could say that it was like a big swing. Yeah, but, exactly. When you're like, oh yeah. man, this isn't going to work out. It's like, oh my God, he did it. Um, it's, those, those are fun, fun sports moments. Yeah. But um, I mean, generally yeah. it's going to be Font Garbrand for me just because like, A, I called it like two years in advance when Garbrand was still a thing. Nice. Uh, which that was dope. And B, Font is just awesome. And kind of beat the shit out of him to like a 50-41, which was amazing. So true, bestie. Um, for me, it's any Ryan Bader win. Uh, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, I lost my goddamn mind <laughs> when he knocked out Latifi. I, I flipped the fuck out because he got knocked down. And I'm like, oh, Ryan's going to die. And then he comes back and knocks out Latifi with this gorgeous <laughs> knee <laughs> like, that just makes Latifi go... Eh. He really is the masturbator. Yeah, like, listen, he, he, he is a god slayer. Um, so that, obviously, but when Volkanovsky beat Max Holloway, because I called, I said he would be the champ after the Hirota fight. Like, I nice. put it in my bloody elbow signature. I'm like, Volkanovsky will be the champion. I'm calling that because I was blown away by, by him. Um, Poirier McGregor is an obvious one. And for me, I distinctly remember um, being ecstatic for Miocic beating Ngano the first time, obviously. That was cool because I, I was really sick of people being super high on Ngano. So I said all kinds of shit on Reddit and I <laughs> knew that it would be terrible if Ngano won. So yeah, that was great. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Volkanovski, that's actually super impressive because I know a lot of people were hitching their wagons to Bektich at the time and we know mm-hmm. how that turned out. So uh, yeah, good Pat stuff. Pat Wyman. Though calling you out directly because I, I believed in Bektich a little bit because of him. No, I'm saying like a bunch of smart people. I'm pretty sure Ryan was like, mm-hmm. well, Bektich mm-hmm. is going to be a thing. Like after Lamas people, season, yeah. we were like, yeah, it's like, wow, Bektich really outgrappled Lamas. That's actually super I thought, cool. I thought Bektich yeah. was going to be a thing. Too. Yeah, I thought he'd be a Everyone thing. Did. Like I didn't, I didn't Realistically, read, yeah. Like I, I, even after Elkins, I was like, well, you know, this is kind exactly. of weird, but yeah. Like maybe he gets killed randomly by someone after he gets to the elite. No, it's just, just never happened. What a shame. Mm-hmm. He was such a freak yeah. athlete. Yeah, the answer though. is all the times I've been right. Basically. Which is, it's too many times to list, and I'm not being sarcastic. Oh. I'm right all the time, and I'm always happy about it. I missed an easy one, Aldo Moicano. Aldo Munoz was great, but Aldo Moicano was the one. That was exciting. Cause, yeah, because honestly, it, it's kind of like the Steve ADC thing. Where, like Aldo didn't look amazing through the first round. Like he won it, but we were like, well, maybe he's not looking as good as he used to. And he just fucking murders Moicano with a 36 punch combination. Oh, and the relief when he didn't lose to Jeremy Stevens. Thank God. That was a good one. (laughs) That was. Whenever a fighter I like gets matched up with someone who isn't good, yeah, I panic because I'm like, what if they lose? That's so embarrassing. Uh, I had that panic (laughs) moment in the fight too, where it was like, Mm -hmm. I backed up to the cage. Yeah, he backed up. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> the saddest moment was Connor versus Aldo for me. Like, I don't, I, 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 like, that was the worst. I was that actually sucked. protected from that because I, what, so I had this thing because, you know, I love Chad Mendez and I love Frank Yeager and all these wrestlers and Aldo kept beating him. I was mad at him. Um, and then I was, I was, on, I was definitely on the Connor train on, on his come up. I was into it. And I, I was I was fully on board. I'm like, he keeps predicting this stuff and he's knocking people out and it's crazy and he's doing so well and he has cool counters and I liked him and he was likable as a fighter. So like it made True. sense. Um, and then he fucking did it. And I was like, oh my God. Like that was, it was so ridiculous. Like imagine Still, for someone who wasn't yeah. like really, really invested in Elda winning, like how insane that moment was. Uh, in hindsight, it's like one of the worst things that's ever happened <laughs> in the sport. Yeah. But 
at the time I was actually very happy about it because it was just so insane. Um, I didn't have that much love for Aldo because I was mad at him for beating my fighters. Uh, but yeah, now it's like totally different. <laughs> I actually have to backtrack on that. I unironically logged off of all MMA for like a week wow. after the uh, Bader Johnson fight. Yeah. I, unironically, I was I was broken. I was sad, too. just broken. <laughs> yeah, I'm inured to that now, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Holloway cater burned away any attachment I have to anybody. What a shame. <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to think of more good stuff since we've. I mean, I guess with the schedule, we've gotten ourselves into more of a downer mood. But I don't know. Well, it's hard to happy. think of that many. Well, we didn't immediately go to the moments that made us sad. And that's your fault, Ben. Fuck you. Well, I mean, I, I figured that that might be a follow up question. It wasn't. So. It's all you. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to fit in. Yeah, the you subsequent didn't... question is which Orthodox fighters are best at setting up and landing the right hand? So, Tyron Woodley, easy one. <laughs> uh, who else? I mean, I took the obvious one. It's on you Rumble's guys. Now. pretty good at it for I don't a know what it is about my brain, but I do not like quickly make the distinction of a fighter's handedness or like stance. Yeah. That's something I have to pay attention to specifically. Cause like I'll read someone's analysis and they'll be talking about stances. I'm like, damn, I didn't even think about that. Um, eventually I did, but Poor when I'm just watching actually. normally, I have to like look and be like, okay, what's going on? Yeah. Corey um, is a good example. Poor, actually, Poirier is weird. excellent, but he's not a Southpaw. He's a, he's an Orthodox, but he's, he's yeah. a right-handed. He's right-handed and Southpaw. Fight Southpaw. And he's incredible at, at landing that right hand. Like, he's so good at it. Yeah, um, lots of really... Rumble yeah, is another one I could think of yeah. who's really good at it, or used to be. Yeah, I think you're going to look at a lot of strong jabbers as being that sort of type. I mean, a lot of them just make a living off Volkanovski. moving guys. Yeah, Volkanovski's a great one. A lot, a lot of them just make a living off moving their guys around with the jab and smacking them with the right hand when they're out of position. Max Holloway's a good one. Cater. Uh, Calvin Cater's a good one, yeah. Um, Pretty much any good boxer who's yeah. orthodox <laughs> yeah lots of great jabbers Woodley. like you could live with just a jab and a left hook in theory but a, mm-hmm. most don't like why else use the jab really the guys who you would think of like the question seems to be geared towards more like which guy who has a kill shot right hand is really good at setting it up seems to be more the question that's being asked i mean there's and always the really, dan henderson's stumpy oh, inside leg yeah, kick. <laughs> it's dan henderson like if that's like if that's the route you're going it's dan henderson oh, like because that guy set it up on um, virtually every well, person I was joking he's ever about that, but, yeah. i think not, he switches like he switches dances but uh it's patricio pitbull Orthodox, just his, I think his he's cross orthodox. counters. He's orthodox. Yeah. He's orthodox. And his cross call, counters actually. might be the best. Um, Abdul Vassal, if we're talking about cross counters. Yeah, AAA, yeah. yeah. But yeah, unironically, like Dan Anderson, by the way, another great call out, uh, a goal for like a slow fighter. Like that dude is slow as shit. And, and he has bad cardio. Bad cardio, slow as hell. Uh, basically has duct tape knees Hips and everything work. else. <laughs> Nothing works, but somehow manages to land a bomb of a right hand on virtually everyone he it's fights. Torso so, rotation. It's his back. I don't know what. He has that glow to It's crazy. Mm-hmm. He is a freak. The amount of power he carries is crazy. Like he'll be seventy-five years old. Someone will try and mug him, and he'll kill them. <laughs> yeah, I think Volkanovski is kind of a weird example. Like as we mentioned earlier, because he sets up the right hand like a completely different way than we're used to. We've mostly been talking about like really strong jabbers, but Volkanovski does a lot of stuff off that, like inside leg kick, where he draws counters and walks guys into the right hand. Uh, honestly, not thinking about strong cross counters because it's like kind of tough to think of them. There aren't a lot of like defined Hunt. ones. Mm, Hunt's a decent one, at least for heavyweight. Remember when he knocked yeah, out sure. well, yeah. that, that was awesome. awesome. That, that was a, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I thought of it. Like Mark Hunt, like that was one of his favorite punches to throw the cross counter because yeah. he's so short. So Vicente Luque is a decent one. Uh, he relies cool. more on the left hook, but he does do yeah. a, a couple of nice cross oh, yeah, counters he kept, in every fight. I think it was uh, the Curtis Blades fight. He kept uh, he kept hitting. His, I think it was the cross counter because um, yep. Blades yeah. likes to, uh, you know, to jab. Leave, leave, his, leave his jab hanging out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Damn, you killed him too. He damn yeah. you killed Curtis. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we got a bunch of answers there. Uh, let's see what's next. How good do you think Duran's stroke game was in the eighties? Well, we need the boxing team for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, honestly, there aren't that many questions. Um, oh, do you think more fighters should institute a more effective front headlock game into their game, or how would they go about this with the current rules? No. So, yes. No. <laughs> Fucking yes. I'm, I'm glad we no. have a debate. <laughs> I'll moderate. It's fine. Just go on. 
if you're in a grappling once, situation, once they're absolutely. Grappling, yeah, but like yeah. as a system, it's like, yeah, I'm going to set up everything to be in front of headlock. Like, probably not. In terms of oh, takedown no, defense, no. it's always pretty porous to me. I don't really like guys going into like a big front headlock series when they're supposed to be defending takedowns, mm-hmm. usually because it means they're going to their back, and that's not a good idea most of the time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think a front headlock is usually pretty versatile, which I mean, if you can use it to keep yourself on your feet, I think it's good. Uh, Every single fighter who doesn't learn how to do the Jack Hermanson guillotine is a, I'm sorry, you're a fucking fool. There is mm-hmm. no danger of getting your ass like reversed from it. You're potentially going to get the choke and worst case scenario, you take the back or get them out. Like it's yeah. the dumbest damn thing in the world. I fucking, it from like, turtle. it's my, it's Definitely so ridiculous. Definitely it from turtle. Yeah, that's how it, it got makes Gerald no sense for me. Mm-hmm. It makes no sense for me that that kind of guillotine isn't like more prevalent and the, people are still sitting back for the arm and guillotine when they don't even know that they're not supposed to arch, but they're, they're, they're not Pedro supposed Pedro Munoz to arch, hit it to... on Doan, but Doan yeah. standing on mm-hmm. his back, standing against the cage. Yeah, that kind of crossed over. over. It's, <laughs> it's, it was insane. It's so effective. If you can nearly choke out Jacare to the point where he said, like, I was going out and I'm lucky I got out of that, it works. Yeah, it, and keep mm-hmm. in mind, Jack Hermanson's a guy who got kind of crapped on by Talish ladies on the ground for a lot of it. So if he can do that, Tyler to Jack that. is a really good grappler. That's not. An he was old as shit, though. He did not look He's good. That still fight. really good. He had a hard time with Tom yeah. Watson. <laughs> who the fuck is Tom Watson? Exactly. I, I'm joking. I know who he is. Tom Kong Watson from Eng- not England, but he was like that crusty ninety-five year old face. Is he? Yeah. Huh. It sounds like an England name. Mm. Tom Watson, definitely. His nickname was Kong. Because he. Uh, Hit hard, maybe. Who knows what he did? But <laughs> I no, just remember didn't. Talos Lade is having a hard time. I don't think he him. did. That's the thing. He doesn't knock anybody out in the UFC. Right, if I, don't I don't get remember, it. Then I don't know why he's calm. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe right. it was a Brad one punch picket thing. <laughs> a, a, a misnomer. I think I did have one of them. I think it was uh, Yves Jobuin. But, uh, but yeah, back on the front headlock. Yeah, I think it'd generally be a good idea to have one. It's just something not to rely on too much, if that makes sense. Uh, if you're insanely confident in your submissions then like sometimes even the guys who are good at it like uh, Pedro Munoz we've mentioned him a bunch of times in this podcast I remember the fight with Brett Johns where he really beat the shit out of him just like completely ruined him and then he kept falling to his back on a guillotine every anytime it looked like he was going to get a finish and it was really funny to me like it didn't it, it made sense because you're Pedro Munoz but on the other hand it hadn't worked like four times and he went to it the fifth time so mm-hmm. you know there's always kind of a risk even if you're good at it but yeah, I mean, uh, it can't hurt to have it. Uh, if you use it well, it's good. So I think uh, really MMA depends. fighters see having a front headlock game as having a bunch of chokes, and we have talked about a bunch of chokes, but also, like, can you control from front headlock? Can you snap down? Can you pass yeah. reliably to turtle or the back from front headlock? Like, do you know how to keep someone down? You know how to put them back down? You know how to... Do you know stuff? Do you know how to do things from front headlock? And, like, um, usually they don't. Um, it cradles like, uh, the fucks. Definitely a shout Look, out to Gregor Gillespie who transitions really well from there. Uh, Joe Benavidez. Uh, Joe Benavidez, everyone's like, oh, guillotine. He he just had good front headlock control. Pedro Munoz has good front headlock control. He doesn't hit his guillotine until after he establishes whatever the sequence is going to be. If you shoot on him, he uses front headlock with his sprawl, and then he guillotines you. Like It's not Dustin Poirier just like completely disregarding his lower body and, and hopping on every guillotine. Like You got to have the procedure yeah. down. Yeah, when I say front headlock, I don't mean like you described the Justin Poirier, I'm going to sit back for every guillotine I can. Um, I'm talking about like sprawling, getting really good control, and then working a specific game where you're threatening yeah. both submissions and taking the back, uh, reversing them so that they're on their back. So like if you uh, if you threaten Darce chokes or, or Anacondas, the setups, they're going to react and it's going to give you opportunities to take their back. You're going to be able to roll the flip them over if you're able to get the. I don't know what it's called when you get the the, the forearm across the back of the neck and rotate them over. It's like the power Nelson, right? Or something. Power half, I guess. Power yeah. Half, Corey so Nelson, use, Nelson. I don't understand why more fighters don't utilize that. Fighters are big and strong. You can put a lot of pressure if you're big and strong for the most Shout part. Shout out uh, so Yuri you Alcantara who uh, put Corey Sandhagen on his back from standing. Oh yeah, that Corey was Nelson. wild. Um, so. To me, yeah. like that's what I think of when I think front headlock. Establishing a really good control first and then working your game from there. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of control from there. You're in no danger, like absolutely no danger. If you had a really good sprawl and you're able to stop them from reshooting or whatever it is, like there's a lot of options from there and it's not going to burn a ton of energy either, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So a I lot think of it's fighters, a great option. Um, 
also don't know how to use their hips in that position if they're on if they're on top um, and they're yeah. sprawling or something like that. They don't know how, they don't know how to put pressure on the back of the neck and the back of the head with their hips. Like you gotta, so, you know, when you learn to sprawl, if if you're learning from someone good, uh, they they show you to go to one hip. You know, and they don't say yeah. oh, kick kick both your feet back and go you know dick in the dirt. They might say, <laughs> um, if they're shooting just straight on, arms reaching out, fine go ahead. Um, but if you want to smush them, you go, you yeah. go, you pick a side and you dig your hip into them and you, you sink those, those hips down, you feed them hips. And if they start to get back up, you do it again. You actively use your hips and press down them. You beat them up with your hips. And if they're coming up on you, you hit them again and you, you keep snapping them and you keep hipping into them. And that's, that's how you learn it in wrestling. And, uh, I, I almost never see that in MMA. Yeah, I, mean, I think why... one thing I remember very clearly yeah. is uh, Adesanya Vittori, where Adesanya had like uh-huh. a super deep sprawl. I think it was the first one. Adesanya Man, he just had, like, lifted his hips up. Yeah, he <laughs> just kind of like took an angle easily and just kind of tipped him over onto his back. So, yeah. Idiot. So, uh, the reason for that is because of Jiu Jitsu. Um, MMA gyms that aren't going to have like a strong wrestling program mm-hmm. uh, are going to have that problem for the most part because if you come up through Jiu Jitsu or an, I guess a non wrestling uh, background and your grappling comes from MMA slash jiu-jitsu grappling, that's what's going to happen. Like, that's how they teach you to sprawl. Like, oh, step, post your hands. for jiu-jitsu really... too. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. Like, Matt, uh, this is not to shit on Matt. This is me just, like, talking about Matt's actually a really good grappler. And he came with me to the MMA gym, and I'm like, dude, stop sprawling like that. One hip, let's go. And it, it makes a world of a difference. Like, that's something that I'm religious about. Like, I will only sprawl on one side, like one hip, one hip. Like, yeah. I'm not doing that, like, double foot back and I'm going to do straight on, because like, it's not Listen, really going to work. No, even yeah, when you do burpees, kind of burpees, you should go one hip when you do burpees. <laughs> Get in the habit. <laughs> if, you're training, if you're training for grappling, then yes, do one hip. Um, but yeah, it's, it's because of the way, it's, it's because of the way MMA is kind of structured across the country slash world, really. Yeah. Shaking my head. I think the um, the last point is how a front head left hand can fit into your overall game tactically, uh, because we've been talking about kind of as like a re- um, a reactive tool to deal with like takedowns that sort of thing. But we have seen examples of fighters funnel their opponent into the front headlock, and if you're able to do that, I think that's probably a much better alternative than using it reactively. Where if you're able to, for instance, like defend takedowns in a normal way, fight grip, sprawl, and break off. And once they're shooting desperately, you can do that sort of thing. Once they're like hunched over, uh, we have seen examples of guys like Tony Ferguson do that, where a lot of his pace work and that sort of thing, it gets guys shooting or it gets guys hunched over and he's able to funnel them into the yeah. guillotine or the darts. Uh, Brian Ortega, another decent example. Um, but it's also kind of risky for the same reasons we've mentioned. It's just that it fits tactically into a game a bit better than a lot of other submission approaches. Um, it's kind of a weird double-edged sword, and I think that's kind of the point we've been making this entire time. It's just you kind of need to make sure that you're tilting the table in your favor as much as you can beforehand. If they ever legalize knees to a grounded opponent, oh, that's, then it'll yeah. become a lot. OP. Yeah, like, yeah, then it's a... I really would like that because I think it would make things a lot more interesting. But mm-hmm. Yeah, it, all, it would pretty much even out the advantage that... Well, I, I don't think it would actually even it out, but the advantage the grapplers have on the ground with grounded knees... It's insane, like completely yeah. ridiculous. That's why pride they was would, mostly grounded knees from the top. I think top grapplers guys. should have an advantage. I think grappling is more effective in a self-defense scenario. Like Very being on possibly. top of somebody, yeah. especially if you're past their guard. I mean, you're you're in an amazing position. So limiting what you can do to someone when they're basically completely defensive um, is unrealistic. But of course, there are safety concerns. But yeah, if you added knees, um, and also if you're allowed to hit the back of the head. Um, <laughs> it, in a realistic scenario, you shouldn't allow that. But I'm just saying, in a realistic scenario, I mean that's that's why grappling is op. Um, if you're a top player, like <laughs> first of all, if you're yeah. like, let's say you're in the street, um, taking someone down is kind of a game ender already um, because it hard you can take someone down hard. Um, it doesn't have to even, even have to be like a slam necessarily. Just if you take someone down hard, that's they're done. Um, so yeah, it's just like. It would make things a little feel a little less. I, think it, uh, I don't know. Sterilized. I think it would give grapplers. A, it would give them obviously more tools. And once you get them down, get the person down, it's great. But for anti wrestlers, really strong anti wrestlers, oh, yeah. it also gives them the option to just knee the fuck out of you from turtle, right? Like, and I think that that like imagine GSP doing what he did to Matt Sarah, but he could also knee you in that knee him in the head. Mm-hmm. Like, like it, it depends. It 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 evens it out. To. 
I think it evens it out nicely. Like it gives strikers a really good tool that can deter wrestlers from taking really bad shots because right now there's really not much of a deterrent from shooting a terrible shot Mm because you might end up in a grappling situation that would allow you to either reshoot pull guard if you're getting you know if you're getting fucked up on the feet might as well right like so i think it would actually make the the exchanges more meaningful and we'd get less like i'm gonna run away until i can close distance and grab a hold of you like like there'd be more happening i'm on board yeah i think that makes sense um uh, I, I mean i think the real issue it isn't really much of a rule set one but it's a safety one and honestly i don't think sports should necessarily be like a facsimile of real life like i think that's a different conversation but either one's fine I'm not with me, sure really. i wouldn't say that they're any more dangerous than being able to knee someone in the head in the clinch um, i mean cleanly. that's definitely true yeah like- so or you know yeah, I think, I think it, in situations where someone's head is on the ground and you were hitting them where they can't, their head can't move, I think that's a lot different, but that's not really what we're talking about. That's yeah, more about but stops. Yeah. It's also but kind of a thing where more, refs can't really look at nuance even now, and that's a nuance that I, I would expect say, them to understand. Well, I would also say that it's not so simple because, one, you can move your head on the ground. If you're, if you're, if you're you know, in... But do they? In a, in a <laughs> front headlock. It's not like you can't move your head at all if the guy's lifting his... You could block you something. It's not just that. It's more like you're probably more in danger of actually like causing breaks, I would say, in, in, in the skull because there's nowhere for the force to disperse. Not my skull. But, I'm built different. Yeah. But you're also less likely to get that rotational force that's going to cause a knockout. So, no, I, I can like, definitely I think, get that rotational see, force. We, it depends. Um, if I'm like on yeah. si- inside control and I hold the head in place and I throw a, a, a high knee to the, to the face, they're not able to move their head that much. Um, so I would say you probably would see more like cuts, bru- um, broken noses and that kind of stuff. But I feel like you'd get a lot cool. more quick TKOs where you'd cool. probably end up having less total con- like concussive force dished out because fights would end sooner, in my opinion. I'm in. It's very possible. And I guess we moved away from the question, but that is like kind of front headlock stuff. Yeah, it is. It is. But yeah, I mean, we've already gone just about an hour, so I'll read out the, the silly ones. Evan Lee asked, why Ed's so cool? And that's silly because we already know why he's so cool. It's because he's Ed. Um, hmm. I could answer it. Do you want to answer? Toasty doesn't hurt. Sure, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. I like learning your secrets. My secret is faking it. <laughs> fake it long enough. Yeah, it becomes it becomes who you are. So uh, just pick who you want to be. Just start being that person, and eventually it'll be true. There you go. All right. Who's the handsomest man on TFS staff? Come on. Yeah, it's a, it's a. Come on. Next question. What does Dan like? think? Wait, of wait, 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 wait. I do want. To... <laughs> That's a great question. If we're going like overall, yeah, Ed, but like Tommy's a dilf. Oh so. my god! I can't believe you asked so. this, Evan Lee. What the fuck are you doing? I can't keep, take Tommy um, seriously though because he uh, he uses like youth slang, and he's in his forties, so you know it's really fun. Also, takes he's away six three and two forty, so he's an enormous human being. Can't tell over video, so yeah, there you count. Go. Um, Tommy in his driving hat. That's uh... Dan. By the <laughs> way, uh, would advise you to invest in crypto. Because he has taken, you should see his portfolio. It's incredible. Um, that explain like Dan doesn't actually need to work. He does the work with the kids because he just is so wealthy from crypto. So uh, follow Dan for crypto advice um, and DM him about crypto advice because he'll Send really him your appreciate NFTs. that. Yeah. <laughs> Dan sell Dan sells NFTs of rubber to Duran. <laughs> Also, ask Dan about his stroke game. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, I think we're just about done. I mean, next week we have Holly, not Holly Holm, uh, someone versus. <laughs> not Holly Holm. Aspen Norma, Norma Dumont versus, <laughs> yeah. uh, versus Aspen Lad. Aspen Lad. Okay. These I'm are all so my excited. opinions on the fight. Let's end the podcast. Uh, <laughs> all right. There's nothing else on that card. I think I there's. <laughs> the week after, there's Trinaldo. So you guys should look forward to that. But uh, anything to plug while we're finishing this up? Fight site instructional. James Kierski, Gooseneck Guillotine System. It's coming out. Finally. Join my cult. DM me for details. I'm already there. <laughs>
<laughs> Friend of Shira, I'm sure it's out now somehow. I don't know why those oh, exist. Dude. Uh, I ordered the Zach Mikowski shirt. I highly recommend that everyone get the Zach Mikowski All Flyweights Are Bullies shirt. It has Zach's gorgeous face on it, and it has, you know, Zach saying All Flyweights oh, Are Bullies. Damn. And the, the handsome staff member question. Damn, I oh, forgot we had that. Zach. That's, okay. that's unfortunate. To, okay. That's unfortunate. So on the, on the, on the Say Us Again I podcast that, that we're releasing very soon, which you should all check out, um, we talked about that. Like, Zach is, he transcends staff. Like, he's not regular staff. He's like, yeah. a, a, I don't know. He's like a special level. Listen, whatever so. roles you want to make up that gives me the win for that question, I'm yeah, all I'm down. Just, I'm here I'm for just, it. I'll let you win on a technicality. All right. I'm, I'm down. I'm down. All right. Well, yeah. So next week, it's going to be Costa versus Vittori after the, this next event. So that should be kind of fun. There's Trinaldo. Uh, that's pretty much everything. So until the, um, the event on the 30th. We are still working with scraps, so if the uh, Discord people want to send us more questions, I guess we'll address it if we still do the do podcast. It again. So, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll send out a tweet as well, just because, like, the questions this time were not as many as I think we generally want. We kind of ran I don't, through them. I don't want too many questions. So, I want this amount. This is good. I mean, I think this it's good, good, but also, like, yeah, I'm fine with anything. Just send us more questions, because, I mean, this is a, it's a dire season. Please. And, and give me that. lots of compliments again. I like that. <laughs> you, you have all of us for that what the fuck man uh, yeah uh, so I think we're done so three two one